Welcome, welcome you all to our webinar. What's today's topic of our webinar? The topic is challenges and optimized usage for valves in membrane systems for water treatment. I think it's a very interesting topic which we are covering today. Before we dive into this topic, let me quickly give you some more technical details. On one hand, after the webinar, you will receive a link and you can watch the webinar at any time you want. So that's number one. Number two is we have a chat function in our webinar. That means we have a back office. We have some guys in the back office who are answering your questions as good as possible. If they cannot answer any question you will send to us, then we have our two speakers, which I will introduce shortly to you, um, available after the webinar. All right, let's get started and uh, dive into our topic, challenges and optimized usage for valves in membrane systems for water treatment. Let me introduce our two speakers, which we have today. On one hand, we have Dr. Carsten Persner, working at GEMU as a market segment management manager, as a market segment manager for water treatment. On the other hand, we have Sven Druckenmüller, working as an application manager, specialist also in water treatment. I'm very happy that we dive into this topic today, and I would like to hand over to Carsten and guide us through this very interesting topic. Thank you. Carsten, it's your turn. Thank you, Uwe, for this nice introduction. I'm happy to present to you the, today's topic about valves in membrane treatment system. We will show you a little bit about the application, the membrane technology, the ion exchange and water treatment. I will show you some examples about the application, where it is used. Before we switch over to my colleague Sven, he will show you more details about the valves, about the valve selection and the challenges for valves in filtration systems. So let's start with the water treatment process. In general, the water treatment process is cut in different treatment steps. So from the intake to the outlet of the water, you have different treatment application processes. So it's aeration, flocculation, particle removal, and so on. But all over, it's all about adding something to the water or removing something to, from the water. Adding to the water is mainly the chemical side, so dosing chemicals for disinfection, oxidation. Removal is mainly filtration or adsorption or flocculation. In today's webinar, we will focus on the removal of the content so I will start to talk about the filtration processes and the adsorption processes in water treatment. We have a focus on the micro ultra nanofiltration, reverse osmosis and ion exchange technologies. Filtration can be seen as a kind of removal of particles, but also of solved compounds. When we're looking at this scheme, we see that the microfiltration, for example, covers a range of 0.5 up to 10 micrometer size for particles. So it's a removal of particles from water. You can say it's like coffee making, coffee brewing. So you have the powder, you have water, the powder stays in the filter, the water means the coffee flows through. That's a little bit like filtration also in industrial processes. When we're looking at reverse osmosis, it's a little bit different. It can also remove solved content from the water, salts and other compounds. Um, this is nice, but it has a problem because the energy consumption is high for such process. So you cannot use reverse osmosis for everything. Um, Depending on the pore size, you need a different pressure. That means a different energy consumption. So you select the filtration method uh, according to the particles and what you want to remove. When we're looking at the industrial processes, we see different places where we see 
membrane filtration and or ion exchange as a treatment for waste uh, and inlet and wastewater. We have the general water treatment in the beginning. We have the wastewater treatment at the end where we have minimized liquid discharge or zero liquid discharge. That's a part of the process for water reuse. And in between, we have a different type of process water, which we need to treat. For example, for the boiler feed, we need deionized water. So a higher quality than, for example, for washing water. This is the simplified process of the water treatment in industry. So the horizontal flow is from water intake, water pretreatment over water usage. You get the wastewater, you get the wastewater treatment and the release. But if you want to reuse the water, you looking at the blue circle, the water cycle, where we have different additional treatment steps. We have biological treatment and or membrane treatment. And here we find again the membrane treatment or the ion exchange. So looking at the intake water, we see different type of quality of the water, of the raw water. And on the other side, we need different water quality for the process. So the treatment itself depends on both, so the water quality for the intake, but also the required water quality at the end. Usually water sources are groundwater, surface water, sea or brackish water in the coastal areas, but also spring and tap water. And when we're looking at the water intake in the German industry, on the right side you have this chart, we see that groundwater and spring water are the preferred water sources. Because with that you do not need too much treatment and uh, the water is easy to treat for the required quality. But all over, membrane separation and ion exchange is also needed for this treatment. This is an example of a process for water treatment from tap water to ultra pure water. Ultra pure water is used in pharmaceutical industry, semiconductor industry, but also for the power to X applications. And you see that you have the treatment steps in between. You have ultra filtration, you have reverse osmosis, and uh, different chemical dosing, which is related to that. And for all these process steps, you need a lot of valves. And the valve must be selected depending on the requirement in each system. So chemical resistance, uh, flow, pressure, and so on. More details for that you will hear from my colleague Sven. He will tell you about the selection and the challenges for the valves in such systems. Here's another example of the intake water treatment. It's for the beverage industry here in that case, especially for the brewing water for uh, the beer brewing process. Uh, usually you take uh, good qu water quality from the start, well or tap water. You have, a, let's say, basic treatment. It's about removal of iron and manganese. Hardness adjustment might be done and a disinfection. One part of the water is going directly to the brewing process. The other part is the utility water. And that might be treated in an additional way with membrane filtration, ion exchange, depending on the use of that process water. Finally, at the end, you get some wastewater. All processes will end up in a wastewater and you have different type of wastewater to be treated. And depending on the industry, you have different content uh, in the wastewater. You have the organic polluted water, which is usually seen in the food and beverage industry, pharmaceutical industry, pulp and paper industry. Inorganic load is mainly in industries like the steel production, power plants, mining, marine, or semiconductor industry. The mixed content, and this is the most complicated to be treated, can be found in chemical industry, in textile industry, but also in industrial parks where the mix of all different types of wastewater is treated. So the treatment of this wastewater depends on the load type. When we're looking at the organic load, we see the biological treatment as a first step, but you also have the membrane filtration processes afterwards for the reuse. 
The inorganic loaded water is mainly treated according uh, to the membrane filtration systems, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and so on. The mixed water needs everything. So you need a biological treatment and you need this uh, membrane treatment. So it depends on the water type, how the treatment should be done. Here is an example of a reuse process. It's from the Carlsberg Brewery in Denmark. They are reusing 90% of the treated wastewater. So they're starting with a conventional water treatment, in organic load mainly, with biological treatment. The effluent is then treated afterwards with an ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, a kind of conditioning and storage to be reused. So this is an example of how a water cycle is done in practice. And in each of these processes, you find membranes, you find valves. Here's a last example for a high salinity wastewater. This is a picture from Dow Chemical. We see from the inlet, from the wastewater, we have different treatment steps, sand filtration, ultrafiltration, ion exchange, a low pressure RO, high pressure RO, and even an ultra high pressure RO. That's a specific solution from Dow Chemical, but also, um, finally, the crystallization. Uh, so this is a zero liquid discharge process, which is also coming more and more. And you find that in the power industry, mining industry, chemical industry, as I said before. The point is, at each of these application treatment steps, you need valves, a lot of valves. Um, but the use of this valve depends on different criteria. So chemical resistance, flow and pressure are important to be observed. And if you're looking at the high pressure RO, we're talking about pressure 80, 90 bar, up to 120 bar pressure. So it is very important to select the right components for that and the right valves. But my colleague Sven will tell you more about these challenges and about the selection of that valve. So now I hand over to Sven. Sven, now it's your turn. So, thank you, Carsten. So, welcome now to the part of the challenge for the valves in the membrane separation and our opportunities we have for the intelligent solutions. So, when you're looking at the different steps of the water treatment, you, we have the simple steps like the sand filtration. Here we also need only a very small number of valves, which are not very complex, only uh, on-off valves, for example. Uh, but as Carsten said before, when we have the membrane filtrations, but also ion exchanges, we, we need a lot of more valves in here. And here we have typically also a chemical influence, so we have a higher uh, technical demand for the valves. So when you're looking at a typically uh, ultrafiltration system, for example, here you can see the different types of valves and controls which are needed. So when you're looking at the raw water inlet, uh, we only have an on-off function for switching on off the uh, whole plant. Uh, this is quite simple, but we need a control function. For example, if you have some flocculant dosing in here, then in, after the ultrafiltration, uh, the filtration has to be cleaned regularly, so we need a backwash pump, which is typically flow controlled, and you need a chemical enhanced backwash very often, which uses uh, harsh chemicals like chlorine, caustic and acid, so we are looking at for the chemical resistance in here. And also for drainage and so on, we need the on-off uh, functions in here. When you see such plants, for example, on the left side, we see an uh, ion exchanger. Here, a lot of different valves. In here, uh, you see some diaphragm valves installed, but also some flow meters for the control of the feed and the control of the regenerating chemicals. Um, on the right side, you see an ultrafiltration plant. Uh, so here we have much bigger diameters, so we are using uh, butterfly valves, but for the control you also can see some pressure gorges 
and some flow meters in here. And in total, typically, there are up to 14 uh, different valves or uh, sensors installed in each uh, rack. So, the flow in those processes can uh, fluctuate. So, uh, there might be some different reasons. For example, the reason might be the raw water. For example, if you have high uh, rainwater, there might be turbidity in the uh, surf uh, surface water and also then in your raw water. So, this might influence your water. Temperatures might influence it. For example, if you have an algae bloom in the water, there might be an influence on your membrane system. Also, your, your own factory has the influence for during night shifts, there is only a very small demand of water. During uh, yeah, the days, you need a lot of water, so there is always a fluctuation in the water demand. Um, then, for example, you can see the membranes uh, fouling after a while. So it's an aging of the membranes or fouling is the biological uh, effect. Um, this is typically removed from time to time to, to uh, the backwashes. So here can be only removed a little bit of the um, dirt on the membranes. And Normally, you have a chemical enhanced backwash uh, every time, let's say several times a day or in a week, or in some cases, if it's a quite clean water in every month, for example. But here you are using all the chemicals I explained before, so you have to look on this SIP process also. And due to the contamination of the membranes, your flow will be affected. So. These are five typically uh, effects on the flow and the valves have to uh, uh, find a solution for the, uh, adjusting the flow. So typically you see your standard uh, solution, you have a flow sensor, the flow sensor sends a signal to your local PLC, uh, then the PLC is normally connected to a central plant control system and um, it will uh, yeah, say, say to the valve, okay, we need more flow, we'll, we need less flow, and then the control valve will operate, let's say, by a field bus system or whatever. A smarter solution in some cases might be sending directly the signal to the control valve. So we have a reduced data transfer. Um, this might be very useful if you have very big plants, so you can reduce the data stream in your plant and you have a closed system in that case, which is independent for that. So, valve so uh, solutions for all of the water to, uh, treatment requirements, so a little overview about the GEMI portfolio. So, we have First step is typically choose your right valve for the application. Uh, so we have a lot of products, for example, for the simple applications we have our ball valves. For the bigger ones we have uh, butterfly valves. For dosing applications we have uh, of control valves are the typical globe valves. The next step is choosing the right material. So depending on your chemical and the chem on the temperature and pressure, you have to choose your material like plastics or metals. Here we have also a lot of different materials. Then the next step, which kind of control you want. We have the manual valves, we have on-off valves and also regulating valves. And then it, have, uh, it needs an interface to the PLC. So the simplest one is a digital, so only an on-off signal or very often analog systems uh, signals. If you have a regulating valve or a flow meter, you have a 4 to 20 milliampere si uh, signal or you have some bu bus signal, so you need the protocol type. And there are very often additional functions like sensors, on-off sensors, or other sensors in the systems and also. So 
typically those sensors and those interfaces, these are also the new challenges for the industry 4.0. Then after defining all this, we have the defined and configurated product. In the applications, for, um, yeah, the typical steps of the treatment are quite similar. So you remove some suspended solids or dissolved sol uh, solids. Biological treatment is only in the wastewater treatment. Disinfection very often used. Sludge management also in, uh, in combination with the biological treatment. And you have your water intake and your water distribution. For those parts, we have valves, for example, for the process and the drinking water. Uh, treatment also for the pure water for pure water and ultra pure water systems we have valves but also for the wastewater treatment um, we have well different valves for those uh, demands our typical product groups are the diaphragm valves you might know our flow meters we have the butterfly valves the ball valves globe valves check valves and solenoid valves <clears throat> So for general water treatment, uh, we call it a type A because it's the lowest demand for uh, the valves. We have a lot of different types. I explained the types before. So we have the solenoid valves, all in the materials plastics. So uh, three different types of plastics and metal, here typically stainless steel or brass. Um, we have the butterfly valves also from the smaller sizes in plastic up to the N300 in plastic. And we have our metal butterfly valves uh, from small diameter DN25 up to DN1600 in big application. For the control option in here, for the butterfly valves, for example, we can choose from manual, pneumatic, or motorized valves. Same, for example, we have ball valves also in plastics and also in metal and also with the control options in manual, model, pneumatic and motorized. This is the big advantage. We have both uh, materials, plastics and metal and typically uh, the three different control types. Also our globe valves, which are very often used uh, for the control functions. Um, also uh, in those three control option types. You might have seen our diaphragm valves, very often our plastic diaphragm valves, uh, from the small diameters up to the N100. Um, our metal diaphragm valves, also from the small uh, diameters, um, from the N3 up to the N300 in our full bore diaphragm valves. Um, so, also our check valves and some sensors, flow meters and so on. For the aggressive water, so the types of uh, chemical influenced water, let's say that, let's say with some chemicals or salt water, we have very often plastic valves because they uh, don't have the problem of corrosion. Here we have um, our solenoid valves, plastic butterfly valves also, uh, different types of ball valves and diaphragm valves in here and check valves. F uh, for the metal um, valves we also have solutions because here we have to coat those valves. For example, the butterfly valves will be coated with a HALA coating or there might be the solution of a duplex steel if it's a uh, higher amount of salt content in the water. Also diaphragm valves we can uh, deliver with the PFA coating or PP coating if the um, chemicals are not that harsh. So flow meters you might also know for uh, very often used in the dosing for the chemicals. So if you have purified water for example for the food and beverage uh, part or in the pharmaceutical sector they are very often uh, used stainless steel and PTFE. Here we also have butterfly valves for this application uh, with a uh, PTFE sealing. We have the ball valves um, with a special high alloy of stainless steel. 
we have globe valves in stainless steel for this application and also the diaphragm valves. Especially the diaphragm valves have the big advantage um, made of stainless steel. These are um, very good to the zip, so steaming, steaming in place and zip cleaning in place processes. And also, last but not least, we have the check valves also in the stainless steel. For our quite special um, application, the ultra pure water, for example, in the semiconductor application, we, there are usually fluorinated plastics applied. Um, so all the valves normally with contact in water are made of plastic. So the solenoid valves are very often in PVDF. Butterfly valves might be also possible in with the metal housing, but the wetted parts are always in PTFE and PFA. Uh, ball valves are normally in PVDF because of the harsh chemicals. So, yeah. Uh, globe valves we have in the smaller diameters, for example, the C50 with the C PTFE body. Uh, other valves like the diaphragm valves are very often used for the dosing um, of chemicals. Uh, very often in the materials PFA or PVDF. But not, not to forget, we also have check valves uh, in those materials and flow meters and pressure sensors. So when you're looking at the water treatment process, as Carsten explained before, you have a different steps and different uh, treatment chain. So if you have the intake water, this is typically not very difficult water. It's uh, some, you, we define it as water in the type A because it's no big chemical issue. If you have groundwater, surface water or municipal tap water, it's the type A. If you have seawater or brackish water with a higher salt content, um, you need uh, valves for the type B, so with a higher, um, alloy of stainless steel or with a coating or plastic. Then switching to the uh, treatment steps, as we explained in here, the typical membrane treatment, it's not that aggressive, so you can typically choose the valves of the type A because the chemicals here in the application are very often diluted. If you're not in the concentrated chemicals, but normally it's diluted chemicals, so the demands are not too high. If you have the application in the medical sector, for example, with um, chemical zip cleaning or steaming, you need the valves for, of the type B. With a higher um, purification grade, for example, in water for in uh, injection or in the, our uh, ultra pure water for the semiconductor, you have to choose the higher grade valves of the type C and D. But as Carsten said before, all ends in wastewater. So the final, the, the wastewater is typically a quite diluted mix of water. Here are quite simple valves of the type A are possible. So if the chemical load is not too much, so the typical municipal uh, or organic loaded uh, water from the food industry uses valves of the type A. If you have a higher salinity or if you have some acids in the water, uh, very often the va uh, valves of the type B used. So now we are getting to the conclusion. So now, Carsten, may I hand over to you? Thank you, Sven, for that excellent product overview. And I think um, today we learned a lot about valves and the application in water treatment and uh, membrane and um, ion exchange systems. So what are the learnings of today? Um, we need a wide range of valves to fulfill all the demands. We have seen that membrane filtration systems and ion exchange systems are used mostly in all water treatment applications. You find it in the process industry, but even also in the municipal water treatment. The specific steps, they could vary in these applications. So they, depending on the product water type and the quality you need, but also on the conditions, how they are operated. Each 
of these wire treatment systems includes a lot of valves. I think we've shown how many different valves are, are needed and uh, how flexible we should be. The controls also must be included in that because remote control is getting more and more important. The demand for flexible flow control solutions is increasing in the future because systems are optimized, systems need to be flexible in reaction on changing conditions. So this will be a, a very important part, but we are also prepared to solve that. So last but not least, the selection of the suitable valves is crucial for the system reliability, but also for the system operation to get an optimized output with a minimized energy and chemical consumptions. So all over we can say GEMU is a one-stop supplier for valves and related components in plastic material and also in metal material. And I think this, this is a very important feature for using it in membrane and ion exchange systems. So we both say now thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to type it in the chat. Thank you. Also, thank you very much from my side, Sven, Carsten. Uh, very interesting topic, very fascinating. We see a lot of details are very important. And Carsten, I do have one question left from my side. Um, you talked about pressure resistance uh, of valves. Is that an issue in membrane filtration? Oh, yes. Thanks, Uwe, for that question. Yeah, it, it's an issue. And I have shown in one slide the different type of filtration systems, starting from ultrafiltration, microfiltration, down to the reverse osmosis. And the difference in these systems is the pressure you need for that. For the ultra, -nanofiltration, uh, ultra microfiltration, uh, you need a lower pressure, about half a bar, one bar, 1.2. That's not a problem for any of the valves. If you're moving towards reverse osmosis, the pressure increases, but for the application in industrial water treatment, you're going up to 15 bar, 10 bar, something around that. Uh, you can also use most, most of our uh, valves for that. For higher pressure and in special applications, please contact us. There we will find a solution and we will offer you the right valve for this. Good. Thank you very much, Carsten, for that detail. And I'm pretty sure that we will find a solution for you. And uh, a very grateful thank you from my side uh, joining this webinar. Um, I look forward to see you again in one of our next webinars. So from my side, I only can say stay tuned. <laughs>